let's get started here. We'll let everybody kind of kind of roll in. Uh, welcome. Uh, we appreciate you guys joining us today. You know, we put on these webinars to try to provide useful takeaways. You know, so we do want to just to provide tidbits as we move through to just kind of take away and have have some actionable items. Uh, how today will work is real quick. I'll just kind of introduce myself. Aligned. We'll go through these top reasons that we we put together. Talk a little bit about fatigue, and then at the end we do have a Q and A section. So make sure to utilize the Q and A topic. We don't really look at that chat. We'll direct if necessary, but try to utilize that Q and A because that, that's what we'll be looking at to answer the questions uh, at the end. So again, welcome. Our topic today is top ten reasons are we're fatigued. We put together a list of just ten common uh, drivers that we do see in practice. These aren't necessarily top to bottom, highest, lowest, anything along those lines, but um, hopefully, like I said, give some uh, action items here. So who's aligned? Uh, we are an integrated medical uh, practice in the uh, Chicagoland area and suburbs, and integrated basically means we have multiple specialties, right? So our goal with that is we recognize there's not one best end-all, be-all type of medicine. You know, a lot of patients respond to one or multiple modalities. And uh, the majority of our practice is derived in number one, chiropractic. So obviously excellent for physical medicine, injuries, recovery, optimization, degeneration, restoring movement patterns, uh, acupuncture, just great for just overall balance. Um, you know, again, none of these just treat one specific thing, but great for stress, uh, sympathetic dominance, uh, hormonal, hormonal imbalance, massage, complements, all of our practices really well. Uh, great for, again, musculoskeletal based stuff, relaxation, stress management, lymphatic drainage, and then functional medicine. And I'll talk a little bit about functional medicine right now. Uh, functional medicine, best way I can always explain it is just spending time with an individual and just trying to get to the root cause as to what's causing their symptom or impeding their goals. And when I say root cause, very rarely is that one just like silver bullet. Um, it's usually paying attention to just a combination of factors, foundation, imbalances, toxicities, infections, um, things along those lines. So that'll be a little bit more apparent too as we move through and I talk about these these different these different bullet points. So what is fatigue? Um, well, I mean, the fatigue we're talking about today is fatigue that doesn't make sense in the sense of like, makes sense if you only get four hours of sleep, we're gonna drag a little bit that next day. But this is fatigue that can last, right? And sometimes we're doing the things or we catch up on sleep on the weekend and still, you know, towards the end of the day or midday, we could lay down and take a nap at, at any time. And again, trying to pay attention to those variables that could be contributing to it. And why is it relevant? I mean, number one, it's relevant because it does decrease productivity. I mean, for the workforce, but at the same time too, it stinks to go through a day and just not feel good, not feel alert, feel like we should feel like we did 10, 15 years ago. We just don't. And it's such a societal thing to kind of say, yeah, it's just kind of what happens as we age. But, um, and that's true to a degree, right? But we want to pay attention to variables that could be contributing to it. And, you know, that third bullet point is pretty relevant, in my opinion, that only a third of Americans or a third of Americans get fewer than six hours of sleep. Like that's just not enough. And we'll talk a little bit more about sleep as we, as we get into it here. So, um, like I said, not in any specific order per se. These are just common, common drivers. So first thing I want to talk about is nutrient deficiencies. And when I talk about that, I don't necessarily mean a disease per se. So it's very rare that, uh, you know, we would see somebody coming in these days for scurvy or rickets or something along those lines. We're talking more about optimal levels of these nutrients and they are it's prevalent much more than a lot of people think. And I'll go over a couple of just the common ones that, that I do see, but um, you know, why I think it's so relevant to talk about this is that we all kind of know the importance of our protein, our fat, our carbohydrates, right? They're building blocks of our bodies, but these little nutrients, these micronutrients, which we call them are fuel for our cells, right? And we are cells, our, our entire body is cells. Everything's made up of cells. So really our health, our energy, our vitality, our well-being is how healthy our cells are. And these micronutrients, like I said, help help fuel and run metabolic pathways. So um, B vitamins, I mean, these are some of the top nutrient deficiencies. I see a lot of people take B vitamins because B12 or B complexes are known as like the energy vitamin or the anti-stress vitamins. And that is valid, right? Just because B vitamins run thousands of things in the body. They don't just do one thing, but I mean, they play into hormones and myelin sheath formation and red blood cell formation. And you can have anemia if you don't have enough Bs. A lot of, you think, a lot of people think about anemia with, with iron deficiency, but that is definitely the case with B12 folate, sometimes B6, copper, vitamin C. Um, 
but not one B is the best. I like to give Bs in combos, right? Because a lot of times there's two or three that are running the same, the same pathway. Um, vitamin D, the probably the number one most common nutrient deficiency that I see. And especially when it's, you know, kind of in the Northern US, uh, this is a nutrient that we get or vitamin hormone that we get from the sun. So majority of the population deficient in that. We need, you know, a good amount of sun to get the vitamin D we need, like bathing, to, bathing suit type exposure four days out of the week will, will help with that. So obviously in the winter, majority of people run them low. But in the summer, I can't say that I see much less vitamin D deficiencies. And the reason is because we don't get that type of sun in the summer. I mean, we might wear a t-shirt into work, but we're not getting that type of sun exposure. And we're still in an office, a lot of us throughout the day. Not everybody, you know, this isn't obviously for everybody. Uh, magnesium is one of the top, probably three to five nutrient deficiencies or suboptimal levels of nutrients that I see. And magnesium, very important for, again, just so many things, but over 300 things rely on magnesium. Uh, zinc, just like vitamin D, great for the immune system. Same thing with vitamin C, but also very anabolic, great for tissue repair, uh, exercise recovery, thyroid health, same thing with iodine, selenium. And omega-3, I would say is probably second to vitamin D, the, the second most common nutrient deficiency that I do run into. And there, it's very, very important. And omega-3 is primarily found in fish oil and a little bit in chia and flax and things along those lines. But um, very important for cellular membrane health because the health of our cell wall also is important on how easy it is for our body to exchange nutrients. <clears throat> so, and then on each slide, you'll steal an opportunity. Uh, and that's just us talking about ways to, again, the, the action items that I was talking about. So multivitamins, I am a big advocate of a good multivitamin, right? Meaning that it is highly absorbable forms of nutrients from a third-party tested company because supplements are excellent, but they aren't as regulated as a pharmaceutical industry. So you don't just want to pick up any supplement. You want to do a little due diligence with that. But uh, I, I am a big proponent of trying to get as many vitamins and minerals, phytonutrients as we can from our diet. Like that should be our chief goal. But the value of a multivitamin is let's say you run into a week where you weren't eating foods that were high enough in zinc and maybe you don't have a zinc deficiency, but you're running low in zinc and running low in zinc, we're running with a lower chance of tissue repair, recovery, immune system function. So it's just kind of a nice buffer to make sure, hey, I'm getting a, a little extra zinc or vitamin C or B vitamins on a daily basis. Omega-3, big, big proponent of omega-3. And again, you can get enough omega-3 by eating fish. There is no question about that. Uh, but again, our, our fishing industry is kind of done a little bit with fish and sometimes certain fish are still healthy, some are not. Uh, but omega-3 supplementation can be very beneficial with that. And then vitamin D, you know, the thing with vitamin D is why I say as directed on the bottle is you can run into toxicity issues with vitamin D. So a lot of people do benefit, you know, from maybe two to four to 5,000 I use a day, but that isn't a recommendation because you do need somebody monitoring this uh, just because again, too low is not great, too high is not great. This is kind of the sweet spot we want to try to find. Uh, so as I was talking about on the previous slide, uh, diet nutrition Again, like not one thing is the most important, but diet and nutrition, I would say, is very, very heavily towards that. It is very difficult to feel well if your diet is not, maybe optimal is the wrong word, but you're not prioritizing your diet majority of the time. So common reasons that we can see for fatigue, blood sugar dysregulation, right? We all know about high blood sugar, insulin resistance, diabetes, and that is something that without question, we need to get under control in this country, but why that can run into a fatigue-based issue, right, is like just carbohydrates alone, like not, I would say more processed carbohydrates, but carbohydrates cause the glucose spike, which feels good for a little bit, but then we get a huge crash, which again can cause a lot of fatigue. Uh, and we'll talk about ways to combat that, but uh, high insulin, insulin resistance-based issues, right? Insulin's the key that takes sugar, brings it into the cell so we can utilize it as, as energy. And with diabetes, or just insulin resistance in general, we're not doing that as effectively. So food should make you feel better, if not just like the same when you eat it. You shouldn't feel worse. You shouldn't feel dramatically bogged down. And if that's going on, a blood sugar dysregulatory issue could just be something to, to pay attention to. Uh, not pairing uh, foods correctly. So like I was talking about with carbohydrates, carbohydrates aren't bad. It's just that they can have an undesirable effect if that's the predominance of our diet. So especially if they don't have a lot of fiber with them. That's why like grains, fruits, vegetables, roots can be very beneficial carbohydrate sources because there is fiber. There's less of a spike with that. So, and very, very beneficial with meals to try to have a good portion of protein. 
a good portion of fats and carbs altogether because that does keep our blood sugar a little bit more stable. The body hates big ups and downs and spikes. It likes more even. And it's not like you shouldn't have a blood sugar spike. That is a normal thing after eating. Um, and then frequency with eating, you know, skipping meals can be an issue. I have a lot of patients that start the call, you know, their day with coffee, they're good to go. They might have a snack. They might have another coffee. And then at night, their appetite is increased. They have dinner. And for some people, they're not realizing that even though they don't have an appetite, that could be driving a lot of their fatigue based issues. Um, and some people need three meals a day with snacks in between. Some people need three meals a day, period. Some people do well with two meals a day. So every body type is different. So that what that's also something I want to emphasize is just not getting too dogmatic into one specific diet, right? There's a time and place for paleo, keto, maybe carnivore, but like these, some of these things aren't necessarily longevity diets. So we don't want to get dogmatic in one specific thing. We want to find what works best for us. And if we're not finding that, find somebody who can help us find what that is. Uh, and then processed foods, again, something we really need to take a look at. Uh, processed foods, again, if there's certain things you really enjoy, eat them, right? We just can't make sure, we just can't have foods that are high in a lot of chemicals as the predominance of our diet. It just doesn't feed our body. And it goes back to slide number one, like processed foods don't have a lot of these micronutrients in them, or they're fortified with ones that just don't absorb that well. Uh, and then opportunities, you know, I am a big proponent of, you know, grass fed, pasture raised, wild caught, just higher quality, less chemicals, uh, protein based sources. Uh, and obviously, uh, legumes, hemp hearts, tofu, things along those lines can contribute to high quality proteins, uh, healthy fats, good examples, avocado, olives, olive oil, uh, nuts, and then carbohydrates, big proponent of carbohydrates that also have fiber, right? Certain grains, oats, fruits, roots, uh, uh, things along those lines. And then uh, between meals, focus on quality snacks, right? If you are one that does well with snacks in between, try to avoid again, high carbohydrates. Carbohydrates aren't bad. Again, it's just making sure you find that balance. So you get the effect. You start to just experiment with different uh, treatments and see what, what makes you feel best. Uh, number three, hydration, uh, something that's obvious, but not not to, you know, not a lot of people are focusing on this. And a lot of people have a pretty decent, uh, you know, realization once we just kind of shed some light on this is the sense of like, I think a lot of us know majority of our body is made up of water. And we need water to maintain that. And again, for optimal blood flow, blood flow to the brain, less pressure on the organs, flushing waste out of the body. Um, and a lot of us aren't drinking <laughs> enough water and we need water with minerals. We need high quality hydration. Um, and if we're getting less blood flow to the brain, that's one of the things that I see as a, a huge cause of brain fog or mid afternoon, mid afternoon fatigue. And if you think about it, a lot of us go to bed, right? We stop drinking maybe around dinner time. We have eight hours of sleep. We might wake up, have coffee or tea. And sometimes it's not till maybe mid morning or noon until we're getting water. So, I mean, that can be 10, 12, 14 hours that we haven't, we haven't had anything hydrating and not to say coffee or tea is bad. It's just, it's not going to hydrate you like water. So what do we need to do? Find ways to get water in. If it's just not your thing, we got to figure out a way to do that. Right. So can it just be getting a mineral water? Could it be a, a sparkling mineral water time? Could it be just adding, you know, some fruits, veggies, uh, anything along those lines to give us some flavor to it. They make a lot of really cool, um, electrolyte additives now. And if it's not like super high in sugar and colors and paint, it, it can be very beneficial and hydrating as well. Uh, and then not all sports drinks are bad, but a lot of them, again, just like I was talking about a lot of sugar, a lot of paint, you know, stuff that we don't necessarily need. And that's our main source of hydration. That's just too many days drinking things like that. But if you enjoy it here and there, enjoy it. Lack of sleep sounds obvious, but again, same thing just with the hydration, something we need to chat about because not a lot realize or experiment with different intervals to find what makes them feel optimal. So sleep is, I would say on average, good rule of thumb for most people, seven, eight hours of good quality sleep a night is, is very optimal. And if you are having trouble falling asleep, right? Laying there for 30, 60, 90 minutes. I have some patients that lay there, they get in bed at nine, they're still awake at noon or excuse me, midnight. And they are 
they're trying to fall asleep, right? They're doing the things, but something is not allowing there. The rumination is there. Or if you're falling asleep at nine and you're up at midnight or you're waking up and you're stuck awake for two hours at a time, something's going on there, right? We just want to pay attention to that. Uh, sleep apnea, I see that a decent amount in practice. Uh, I don't know if it's underdiagnosed, but something that, that needs to be talked about enough. You know, if you are, have you been told that you snore quite a bit? Uh, it is maybe, again, doesn't mean you have apnea, but something maybe to pay attention to, especially if you feel like most days just brain fog is there, you never pick up like two cups of coffee, you're still not feeling that. And, you know, apnea can can be a game changer, figuring out ways to to treat that and uh, restore oxygenation as we sleep. Uh, blue light can be can be an issue for some. I would say as bullet point number I think four on their shows, the number one reason for patients not being able to fall asleep that I see in practice is their cortisol levels are too high. And cortisol is not a bad hormone. It is just bad if it's out of balance. And it's supposed to be elevated in the morning when we wake up 30 minutes later, it peaks for the day. And that does really help with alertness and the ability to get get going. Uh, but some of us, the things we do on a daily daily basis contribute to an elevation in cortisol levels. And if cortisol is elevated as we're trying to fall asleep, the body isn't going to produce enough melatonin for us to be able to get into that deep restful sleep. And blue light is one of those because blue light does stimulate daytime for some individuals. Not everybody is as sensitive to blue light, but it is something to pay attention to that if you are on a screen continuously, you're go, 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 you know, that that is something that could perpetually keep your cortisol levels up. So what are some, some things we want to try to pay attention to uh, is trying to prioritize, right? If you are fatigued, we want to do some of these basic things because they can be big needle movers, right? Sometimes like basic foundational things like supplements and diet and exercise and sleep and drinking more water. We don't think eh, that can't, you know, be a big needle mover for energy. There's got to be something else going on. And there might be, but a lot of people are surprised when we start to just find a routine. It doesn't have to be crazy things, but it just has to be, you know, paying attention to these to really see how much that can move the needle. So trying to prioritize that. Ideally we're getting, you know, two hours a two hour, hour and a half, excuse me, hour and a half, two hours of REM, hour, hour and a half of uh, deep sleep. Uh, paying attention to electronics. Some people are really, really sensitive to electronics, like we talked about. Some people do really well with a, you know, kind of like non-stimulating show at night. So it's just about you as an individual. And if you're struggling to fall asleep, I'd say take a break off blue light and just see how it goes. Keeping the bedroom dark for the same reason of bringing cortisol down, bringing melatonin up. Some people really, really sensitive to Wi-Fi. So if there's a router right next to your bed, try to turn it off. Like some people are just sensitive to it. Uh, develop a routine. By far, this is the number one recommendation I could have. You know, a routine, something that relaxes you. Uh, a lot of people stretching, deep breathing, just turning down the lights in your apartment, using a pink Himalayan salt lamp for a good light, using a mask, a podcast, reading. It doesn't have to be all or any of those. It's just whatever for you helps you feel relaxed. This can in turn start to bring your cortisol levels down. And sometimes if you pair it with magnesium, melatonin, things along those lines, like you shouldn't need that forever. Once your routine gets you into a rhythm, you should be able to back off some of that stuff. But sometimes the routine is essential to get the body in a rhythm. Uh, try not to drink a ton of water leading right up to bed. Uh, same same reason for caffeine from a urination standpoint, but two, caffeine has a long half-life and breathing exercises. Breathing exercises, meditation, research is there, right? That Breathing doesn't necessarily take away stress, but it does have a really profound physiological response at lowering cortisol and helping our body relax. And this ties in great with, with that uh, in the sense that cortisol not only, cortisol and melatonin are not only the two that control our circadian rhythm, but cortisol does play quite a bit into our energy and it helps us feel alert in the morning. And if it's even, just like we were talking about with blood sugar, we don't want big ups and downs and spikes with cortisol. And saying again, go, same thing with blood sugar is that cortisol is a glucocorticoid, right? So that can cause some blood sugar abnormalities. So keeping your blood sugar stable throughout the day will help keep your cortisol stable as well. But we want to try to find strategies that help keep our cortisol levels in check throughout the day because big ups, big downs can make us feel um, miserable. And there's different forms of stress, right? There is what most of us think about, right? Maybe job, family, schedule, not feeling to have enough time or downtime, um, physical stress. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, on one of the upcoming slides. Chemical inflammatory stress, gut-based issues, nutrient deficiencies. It's even been shown that uh, not getting enough sleep can be an inflammatory driver or a stress to the body. 
uh, lack of sleep for the obvious purpose. I mean, this is this is a vicious cycle that I see quite a bit is that, you know, high stress in the morning, not enough sleep, maybe not eating right out the door, rushing, and then not being able to fall asleep. And sleep is one of those things that beyond supplements is the biggest buffer of stress, right? If, if we are, if our cortisol levels are high and we have high amounts of stress, but we're getting enough sleep, we can sustain that a lot longer. But if we are having high levels of stress and we're getting four or five hours of sleep, it's just not rejuvenated enough. Uh, and then again, lack of downtime. And, you know, there is, I would say, a big push that I've seen probably over the past couple of years into self-care and morning routines and evening routines. And some of that is great recommendations. You know, the thing is we don't need to prioritize big, elaborate, long to-dos with that. But even just simple modalities of, you know, getting sleep dialed in, waking up 20, 30 minutes earlier, just so you can kind of ease into the day or just sit and sip tea or work on a side business or read for five minutes on a book that you want to get done, right? If you're, if you're reading 10 pages a day, you can get a book done in a month, right? So a lot of people want to read, but they fall behind, but that could be done in 20 minutes in the morning, you know, get 10 pages done. So whatever that is, but try to prioritize maybe, you know, 10, 20, 30 minutes in the morning, give yourself a lunch hour. A lot of us are working through lunch, maybe eat, go for a walk around the block, and then an evening routine. I mean, those types of things really can help balance blood uh, cortisol throughout the day. Uh, so opportunity-wise, I already got into that, but schedule time you know, throughout the day, even little bullet points, or even just prioritize weekends off. Um, counseling right, can be uh, an excellent modality uh, and just like a nice arsenal to talk to somebody who is unbiased and just kind of give you more coping coping techniques with stress. And then meditation, deep breathing, uh, big needle movers. Uh, food sensitivities, definitely something we want to talk about with, I mean, just anything in general, any symptoms, gut-based issues, skin-based issues, but definitely fatigue and brain fog. Uh, food sensitivities are different than food allergies and both of them matter, right? Food allergies are going to be more immediate usually like histamine type mediated responses. And those are valuable to know. A lot of people know, right? If they eat it, they get a little rash or swelling or tingling of their tongue. Uh, but that can be done like an IgE blood test or with an allergist doing like a skin prick test that can give you if your, your body has an immediate reaction. Uh, but food sensitivities are usually more of an IgG response and also to a degree IgA. And, and these are going to be more delayed based reactions. And these are nice to know because it could take five hours. It could take 12 hours. You eat something and then now it's a delayed based reaction because it wasn't immediate. And then you notice that you're really mucousy or your eczema flared and it doesn't make sense based on the season or brain fog, right? I see that all the time that, you know, there's common lunches patients are eating and that brain fog hits. They have a sensitivity to spinach. And, you know, again, like that can kind of set off some of that, that brain fog. So this one, you can utilize like elimination diets to kind of pull out some common ones. Um, but food sensitivity testing does give a little bit more directed with that, but you don't necessarily have to, but it is one of those ways like IgE and IgG food panels can be really, really beneficial to target because they take your blood sample, they introduce the antigen, they see how many white blood cells respond to it. And they give you a report based on how many of your white blood cells reacted. So you can kind of know the degree as to how your body reacts to certain foods. Uh, thyroid. So, I mean, without question, we couldn't, we couldn't talk about thyroid and in regards to just energy well-being because thyroid is what the thyroid gland is what helps control our metabolism with our body so a lot of times we've, we've heard of thyroid we've heard of slow thyroid or hypothyroidism and if our thyroid's not functionally optimally our, our metabolism isn't so yes we would definitely feel fatigued even though we're doing the things um, we might gain weight we might have drier skin we might have thinner hair um, we might have constipation we might lose some of the eyebrows and obviously hyper can be an issue as well, um, but hypo is probably what we definitely see the most most common. And the thyroid, I always, I always coin it as a lot of practitioners will say, this is like the check engine light of the body, right? If the thyroid is starting to slow down or there's an autoimmune issue with the thyroid, no, hopefully I remember to come back to that in a second, but um, a lot of doctors aren't paying attention to when they test the thyroid, is it in range? Oh, and what I was saying was the uh, the check engine line of the body. So very rarely does the thyroid just mess up on its own. Usually there's something else triggering it. Sometimes it's nutrient deficiencies, right? Like I see a lot of times patients, their thyroid's starting to slow down. We get maybe some zinc selenium going, it optimizes. Not always does that happen, but it's something definitely to consider. Or there might be an autoimmune component where there is something triggering it. We see sometimes like 
somebody had a really serious virus. And then a couple months later, an autoimmune issue was triggered with the thyroid. And it was something that just, again, just triggered the autoimmune, the, the autoimmune pathway. And a lot of doctors aren't testing for antibodies and getting back to testing. Usually TSH is what's tested majority of the time when people say they test the thyroid. And this, this isn't even a hormone that comes from the thyroid. This is a brain hormone. So it's definitely part of the picture because we want to know how many, how often the brain is screaming at the thyroid. But at the same time, we want to know what our thyroid hormone levels are as well. And uh, Synthroid or other thyroid medications are very, usually one of the top two or three prescribed medications. And again, reason is because there's a lot of things triggering hypothyroidism, but a lot of people dealing with fatigue and getting, getting treated with that. But sometimes why that won't give us the relief we're looking for is that it'll raise your T4, which that's what Synthroid is. It'll bring your TSH down, but we need to have enough T3. And if our body's not converting to T3, we still don't notice the improvements, even though our lab work looks good. So uh, that is, again, paying attention to the immune system, paying attention to the nutrients, paying attention to where a lot of thyroid activity happens. And that's going to be in the gut and the liver. A lot of people with IBS, inflammatory bowel issues, gut-based issues, also in tandem have thyroid issues. And that, that is not a coincidence. Uh, and then I, I would say also in tandem with this that I, I, we didn't really add to these slides would just be hormonal imbalances in general, right? I have a lot of patients that deal with androgen excess, PCOS, uh, estrogen excess, uh, progesterone insufficiency, and ovulatory cycles, irregular cycles. And a lot of that can contribute to sluggishness, weight gain, uh, even like I said, if patients are moving their body and eating right. So these are things that it's very difficult to just do a physical exam or symptom wise without getting tested. Like get hormones tested, get a full thyroid panel. These are things that are just worth knowing. Uh, musculoskeletal pain, big driver of fatigue. I, I see this all the time with patients that it's disrupting their sleep, it's disrupting their daily activities. They can't exercise because every three months they have a back based issue or they have a, you know, they, have a pelvic issue after the birth of, you know, their most recent child that was a couple of years ago, or they have a shoulder injury from high school. And some of that is significant stuff, right? Like severe arthritis, labral-based issues, degenerative arthritis. And that does require, you know, sometimes injections and surgical intervention. There's no question about that. But a lot of patients, it was just an injury and now they have a movement imbalance or they have poor posture. And this issue is just perpetuated by the fact that there's weakness, there's imbalance. And uh, these are things that just need to be noted because this can cause inflammation. This can disrupt your sleep. This can cause fatigue-based issues for that reason. So what are some things we could do? I mean, sometimes just getting get moving, right? Going for a walk, stretching the body, uh, exercise. I'm always going to be a big proponent of that. We don't have to be doing high interval training. We don't have to be doing anything we don't like, but the body is meant to move. And our body does break down once we get into kind of late 30s, 40s, and we start to lose five-ish pounds of muscle mass per decade, unless we're working at maintaining it. And, you know, the thing with being in our 60s and 70s, if we haven't been working, I mean, that's a lot of muscle mass loss. And that's why, too, we see some individuals that have, let's say, a slip and fall and they break their hip. We are seeing individuals within a year, you know, dying because of that. And just keeping the body metabolically active will reduce will reduce risk of that. But also, too, there are a lot of specialists that can just pay attention to movement patterns and educate on proper form. Because the other issue too, is if you have an imbalance and you're exercising, you could be worsening that imbalance by, by strengthening it um, inappropriately. So chiropractors, um, uh, condition range specialists, ART, you know, physical therapists can, can really give some guidance with that. Uh, impaired detoxification. Uh, again, something I'm also seeing on the rise in advertising and in the health field and detoxification. We want to kind of spend a little time, I don't know if defining is the right word, but I guess differentiating detoxification versus cleanse, but um, how our body detoxifies, right? Is we are exposed to, it's called stuff on a daily basis, right? Heavy metals, um, parabens, PCBs, right? As they say, we, by the time we leave the house, we've been exposed to over 200, 250 man-made chemicals, right? And that's in our cosmetics and our shampoos and our conditioners and the food we ate and stuff we're putting in our skin, on the fabric softeners we use. And that kind of stuff builds up in the body in addition to like small amounts of heavy metals and the food we eat and the water we drink. And this stuff, like I said, can build up. But, you know, our body's smart. It does detoxify. It's, it's just, it's built to do this, right? Our liver cleans our blood. It dumps it into our poop and we poop every day, hopefully, right? Like that's why it's very important if we're not pooping every day, 
that's one of the biggest reasons. I mean, that can cause hormonal imbalances, histamine-based issues, so many different things if we're not pooping every day. Um, we have to pee every day. And again, getting back to exercise, we want to find ways to sweat. That's why saunas can be so beneficial because that is another way our body just clears housing and gets rid of stuff. But um, getting back to kind of cleanses and detoxes and what we can do from a support standpoint is there are uh, programs that we can do to support detoxification, right? We want to prioritize, number one, what we're putting in our body and those things I just talked about, peeping, <laughs> pooping, peeing, and sweating. And, but there are detoxes that can be done, right? Supporting the liver a little bit more for a two to four week period to help the body clean house more effectively. But again, that's different than like a colon cleanse or a juice cleanse, which there's nothing bad with those. They're just not necessarily a detox per se. So all, all good, just, just, just different ways that they can um, uh, have an impact. So uh, things we can do, right? If we aren't having a bowel movement every day, figure out why, right? Is that something that you kind of just like, genetically lean towards that way. So you need a little bit more magnesium or fiber or water, right? Sometimes it is very basic stuff. Or do you have a candida overgrowth, a bacterial overgrowth? Do you have a parasite potentially? It's just diet, not where it needs to be. So um, try to figure out why, drink water, right? Do the things that we're talking about. Um, utilize more fiber from food or a nice fiber powder. Consider, consider probiotics because that can be something that can um, impair bowel motility as well. Uh, and then gut health has to be on here, right? Gut health, just like with diet, it is very difficult to feel well if the gut is not where it needs to be. And the digestive tract, we definitely need to have enough stomach acid. And low stomach acid is something that as practitioners, we run into, I mean, if not daily, multiple times a week. And we need stomach acid. And a lot of us deal from, you know, with heartburn. So that is a balance we have to try to figure out is like, if we have heartburn, we don't just want to suppress our stomach acid because like it shows right here, you need stomach acid to absorb protein and your B12 and your calcium and your iron and your zinc. But at the same time, that stomach acid is meant to kill pathogens, right? Like we eat bacteria, we eat mold, we eat parasites. Like it just is, right? That is just something we have in our food. And if we are suppressing our stomach acid for too long, we're given like a free ride to those things to get in our digestive tract. And that can downstream cause more issues. It's very common for patients who are suppressing their stomach acid too long to have things like constipation or SIBO, which is a bacterial overgrowth because of that specific issue. And not to say that that's always the cause, but stomach acid is definitely something we want to pay attention to and not just suppress. If we're having symptoms, we need to ask why. The body isn't the body's smart and it doesn't just mess up. And sometimes it seems like these things happen overnight or, hey, like this wasn't present two years ago and now it is. But the thing is the body can be pushed so hard for so long. And when we're younger, we can recalibrate and reach homeostasis a lot quicker. But sometimes if we're doing those things for years, all of a sudden it can seem like overnight, but the, the signs and symptoms were there. So just kind of, you know, just listen, listen to the body. And if just something seems right, seek, you know, seek help out. But um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, very common issue. And a lot of times this is the root cause for IBS. A lot of people will get that term IBS, they'll get that diagnosis, but at the end of the day, that diagnosis doesn't really help. And what I mean by that is IBS, I guess like in, in a way like PCOS is not that they're the same, but they are just a name for a collection of symptoms, but they don't necessarily just reveal a treatment. They just say, hey, yeah, you know, your symptoms go hand in hand with this. So, but a lot of times irritable bowel is bacterial overgrowth in our small intestine causing bloating, distension, constipation, diarrhea. Uh, so again, something that needs to be treated because that can also skew your thoughts on reacting to food, right? Some people eat food, they get severely bloated or distended and they think they have an allergy or sensitivity to food, but it's not. It's because there's bacteria yeast overgrown in their gut and it's causing too much fermentation and one needs to get tested for this. And this is a common test. You know, we run this all the time. Gastroenterologists are able to run this. So something worth bringing up if you're dealing with digestive issues and it, this has never been talked about, definitely worth bringing up with your primary or gastro. And then leaky gut, not a theory, right? This is, this is a thing. This is proven now. This is very prevalent in autoimmune-based issues. But I mean, anything in general can, can be the result of leaky gut. So leaky gut the gut should be the outside of our body and the gut should be able to choose what it lets into the body. But leaky gut means the cells aren't as tight as they were. And now things can kind of get through the gut wall into the bloodstream. We're not talking like big chunks of things as microscopic, like bacteria, yeast, ammonia, larger peptides, and this can turn on the immune system. And when that happens, that's when autoimmunity can result. That's when inflammation, skin-based issues uh, can occur as well. And then if you're having a regular bowel movements, like I said, 
bowel movements should for the most part be somewhat regular. You know, you kind of have the same amount of bowel movements each day around the same time. If that's not the case, we want to figure out why. If you're having chronic bloating, abdominal discomfort, again, the body's telling you something. So um, yeah, sure, reducing gluten and dairy, those are big drivers. Dairy specifically, I see as a, as a big um, digestive-based trigger. But again, that's symptom management. You also want to figure out, is there a microbial-based issue? That is that is kind of the take home I would I would say is if you're having chronic digestive based issues, glutamines, right, aloe veras, like all that stuff is is excellent. Probiotics are excellent, but if you have a microbial imbalance, it doesn't usually just go away on its own and that needs to be addressed. Um, ginger tea, hot water with lemon, great for bowel motility activation, great for detoxification. So that is it. I tried to kind of cram a lot in there and give some hopefully some take home so they didn't <laughs> talk too fast and um, but uh, I will take a couple of the questions that I see in the Q&A uh, right now, but real quick, this is just kind of across the board, some of the insurances we take. Um, if you're ever interested in just kind of getting to know any of these specialties or uh, a, a, a practitioner, we do offer 15 minute free consultations where either virtually or in office, you can chat about, hey, you know, they're quick. I mean, we can't diagnose or give a treatment plan or anything on that, but we chat about, hey, you know, what did this, what are my symptoms you're having? Hey, this is my thoughts hearing that. This is what I've done in the past. This is some thoughts I would have on it. Obviously, I'm not putting any other treatment plan or diagnosing or writing a lab order or anything from that visit, but it can at least give you a little bit more directed guidance as, okay, like if I'm presenting with constipation and bloating for 20 years, what are some things you've done for it in the past? And you can kind of, you know, gauge if that sounds like stuff you've tried before or not. Uh, and then our website numbers up there. Uh, and then our webinar, our next webinar is about two weeks. So you can kind of just pay attention to that. And then I will, let me see if I can get these questions pulled up here. Okay, so I think I'm seeing these in the order. So first one I see is about Lyme disease. Um, what are some signs, symptoms, tests that could be done? Heard a lot of brain fog, exhaustion. Yeah, so that would be a good slide to put in here too, right? That could be number 11 in the sense of, chronic chronic infections, right? So mold, Epstein-Barr, any post-viral inflammatory response, uh, any arthropod-transmitted based illness. I mean, a lot of this, right, can cause any type of mystery-based symptom. So, you know, I don't, Lyme disease would be a whole topic in and of itself, but that is arthropod-transmitted, right? Usually like a tick, mosquito, if it's caught early, uh, you know, usually antibiotics are warranted. Um, a lot of times we'll be having a fever, sometimes just mystery-based symptoms. So that's why a lot of patients will go undiagnosed because it can look like a lot of different things. And we're working on sleep and doing all these things, and it is more of a more of a um, uh, infection. So thing places you could start right is at least I mean if it's not, if it's a question you have exposure right you grew up in areas where there was a lot of wooded based issue you've had a history of bug bites. I mean, not, I guess that wouldn't be the only thing, but that'd be something we pay attention to. But uh, you can also just start with just a blood panel, right? Bring it up to your doc, say, hey, I'm just kind of curious about this. Some docs are open to just running the ELISA, or I would at least say the Western blot. Uh, and those are common just blood tests, but there also are a lot of labs that specialize in more in-depth Lyme testing and other arth arthropod transmitted illnesses. So you'd want, you'd have to work with some either a functional medicine doctor or an infectious disease doc that could kind of target that that for you. And there's not, I mean, besides doxycycline initially, there's not necessarily one specific symptom. It's based on the manifestation in you. So I know that's kind of vague, but the thing is that it's not, it's not just one thing. Uh, next, what do you think about intermittent fasting? Uh, the patient's been doing a little over a year, sleeping better, getting good results, traveling, um, didn't have any issues, uh, having some swelling. Uh, could be some gluten intolerance. Why could you eat gluten outside the? Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So why could I eat gluten outside the U.S. and not um, not during? So intermittent fasting, uh, fasting goes back centuries. There's values to fasting, but I would say what we kind of do in this country, right, is something that's great. We'll kind of push it even longer, right? So if a 12-hour fast is great, let's do a 24-hour fast. Let's do a three-day fast. And there's times and places for all of this, right? Like there's not a right way to fast. So if you've kind of heard of a 16-hour fast or an 18-hour fast, like you don't have to do that. And it doesn't have to pair with keto. Like there's just, you kind of, there's just so many different balances with, with intermittent fasting. But I am a big proponent of trying not to eat late, fasting maybe 12 hours overnight. And this is a good starting place for a lot of my patients is, you know, maybe finish eating around seven, try not to eat after dinner, wait till you have breakfast at till seven or eight the next day. That way you're able to have all the meals throughout the day. You get in a 12 hour fast, 
if you feel like you're responding really well, you might want to push that maybe to a 14 hour and you have breakfast a little bit later and you still have your consistent meals. And like I was talking about on the diet page, there is some patients that do really well fasting all the way till noon. And then they have a lunch, they have a dinner, they stay in that window. That's great for them. Um, some patients will do a 24 hour fast once or twice a month and that benefits them really well. So I am a big proponent of fasting, but it's not just one thing. It's about finding that balance for yourself. But what happens there, and again, is blood sugar regula regulation, um, autophagy, where we go in and kill, you know, necrotic tissue and things along those lines. So very, very beneficial. And then gluten, you know, again, gluten is something in this country, we allow a lot more in our food than a lot of other countries. And gluten, we've changed a lot, right? We've hybridized it a lot. And I would say in Europe that gluten is a little bit closer to its ancient grain status. And some patients are responding more to gluten here in this country due to some of the additives or adding yeast or what we've done to that food specifically. And it's like I said, a little bit closer in, um, in Europe there. So um, next questions about itching. So if one were to have anal itching, especially at night, could that mean parasites? What what could be done to find out or stop that itching? Absolutely, right? That would be the top thing my thought would be, right? Is that parasites are more active at night. A good reason why I see a lot of people waking up in the morning are parasites actually and viruses, um, but obviously still the cortisol is the most important there. So parasites definitely are something that need to be ruled out, but I've also seen a lot of yeast and candida overgrowth. So if one is more prone to vaginal yeast infections or um, jock itch or things, you know, other symptoms uh, related to that, that is a thought I would have. And that is done via a stool test, right? I mean, you could topically apply maybe like coconut oil, see if that helps a little bit. I wouldn't be putting too much other in that, you know, area of sensitive tissues like that, but I would say a three-day stool test because parasites are difficult to catch. You want to test them three days. You want to test for the eggs and, you know, treatment wise, you want to make sure you're treating long enough to, to, to kill the eggs as, as they hatch, but at the same time, yeast. So there are a lot of specialty stool tests that can be done. Again, gastroenterologists great at ruling out some of the big stuff that's known, like let's say Giardia, um, E. coli, uh, Salmonella, C. diff, but not necessarily do they run some of the other specialty tests. So that'd be that would be a great question for a, a free consultation. Uh, do milk and dairy provide adequate vitamin D? Uh, they do calcium wise, but um, if you were to have two cups, but at the same time, same like thing that I was talking about with the um, with gluten is we've done a lot to our dairy that it, it you know just cause a lot of inflammation in the body. So. Um, does it provide enough vitamin D? No. I mean, that, that the sun is what we need to get adequate vitamin D. And if you're ever curious on is the food I'm eating enough, well, get tested, right? Like stay on your normal diet, get tested, see where your vitamin D levels are. You can make necessary changes, get tested again, try supplement with it. I mean, that's the thing is control variables, do something for a couple months, measure your vitamin D. Did it go into normal range? Well, that might work for you. If it didn't, you might need to supplement with it. Uh, is glucosamine chondroitin beneficial? Yeah, but again, if we have joint-based issues, we do want to make sure we're eating well. We want to make sure we don't have a bunch of inflammatory-based issues. We're going to be able to make sure that our joint is in alignment. But if we have some degeneration, sure, things like collagen, things like glutamine, things like omega-3 fish oil, zinc, vitamin C can be very beneficial. Um, persistent depression, chronic fatigue, POTS. Yeah, something I mean, we're seeing definitely on the rise, right? Especially with a lot of this post-viral inflammatory response. Um, things that would guide towards that is going back to kind of slide number one. A lot of times with POTS, there's a lot of things that can contribute to that, but I'd be looking at electrolytes, right? Calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium. Make sure those are in balance. Experiment with those. Make sure you got them at the right ratios because that can make it easier to at least do daily activities, right? If you're climbing stairs, it's very difficult to carry groceries in without getting out of breath or being severely fatigued, like start there. But at the same time too, make sure your immune system bolstered, D, zinc, make sure you're not also fighting another chronic infection. A lot of people had infections, got a virus, and now they're dealing with two things and that really depleted them. Uh, if one were, were, if one were worked, works with dogs and cats at a veterinary hospital, when might I think of getting tested for intestinal parasites? And that's the thing with parasites, they're common. Like 20% of my patients test positive for a parasite and they don't always have symptoms um, of a parasite. We always think like loose stools, the anal itching, um, you know, th those types of symptoms, but there's no way to know that for sure, right? I mean, what, what would be the right way if you have symptoms? Well, obviously now, but I would say good practice might be once a year running a three-day stool test just to know, right? Because, you know, you want a comprehensive stool, stool test that's not just testing for Giardia or Cryptosporidium, but obviously Giardia you'd want on there. But um, there could be a lot of other parasites that are, are transmitted. 
Uh, can you recommend any brands for supplements or what you look for to determine a good brand? So yes, there are a lot of good, what we'd call third-party tested functional medicine-based supplements. So I always like uh, supplements that what you just verify is that they're third-party tested, right? They hire somebody that comes in and tests, make sure that the vitamins and minerals that they are um, utilizing are actually in there uh, and that there's not any mold, heavy metals. Uh, but I mean, there's, there's countless amounts. I'd use websites like Wellevate, I'd use websites like Fullscript and utilize supplements on there because those are third-party tested, temperature controlled. But um, I would say Pure Encapsulations, Designs for Health, Thorn, uh, Claire, uh, there's a lot of others. I'm doing a lot of disservice, but th those are some of the ones that come to mind. Um, any natural tips for asthma sufferers? I have all allergic asthma, started to have asthma flare-ups three to four times a year. Right now with weather changes, feel extremely fatigued due to my asthma. Yeah, uh, it is always um, always just so depleting in the sense of how it can affect um, this the, the immune system. So anything allergic, right? We always think gut, right? Make sure the gut's balanced, make sure you have good digestive health, make sure there's no intestinal permeability, things turning on the immune system, um, vitamin C, bromelain, nettle leaf, NAC, very, very beneficial at stabilizing the immune system. Um, obviously using medications, inhalers can be really, really beneficial to at least stabilize symptoms, but also to getting some food, getting food sensitivity testing, anything else turning on the immune system. Uh, NAC can be really beneficial. Um, anything else I think, but again, I don't want to underemphasize gut. I have a lot of patients with asthma, allergies, mast cell activation, chronic hives that I would say by far and large, how I've gotten that under control is figuring out if there's anything going on in their gut because it's, it's, I'm going to use the word impossible to balance the immune system if your gut's not balanced, because that's where 80% of it is. Here's our quick remedy to help with reflux. Uh, I don't want to take medications. wonder if there's any foods that can help. Um, it's layered. There's a lot of things to, to think about with reflux. So a lot of times it's low acidity. So you could trial a diet, talk to your doc about trialing a digestive enzyme or hydrochloric acid and see if like bringing digestive strength helps. Um, avoid trigger foods out of the gates, right? Just makes sense, but that shouldn't be the forever. Uh, make sure you don't have H. pylori, which is bacterial infection. Talk to your doc about that. And that's a simple breath stool or biopsy if you've ever had an endoscope. Um, uh, what else would be SIBO, right? I was talking about that early. That causes a lot of gas bloating, drives acid up into the esophagus. Uh, so that would be, but yeah, Licorice can be beneficial. Um, sometimes using apple cider vinegar, if it makes you feel worse, then it's a hyperacidity issue. So yeah, just just um, there's a there's just a lot of a lot of things that can play into that. I wouldn't say one food is also a trigger, but I do have a lot of patients that process carbohydrates and dairy are big triggers in addition to the acidic foods. But um, if that is a chronic base issue, if it's here and there, and you know why, probably not an issue. But like if it is something that's weekly, daily, your body's telling you something, and try to get ahead of it now before it does turn into turn into something worse. Uh, what's the difference between D2, D3? One's more beneficial. D3 is going to be more similar to what our body gets from the sun. I would stay away from really high doses of D2. It can draw a lot of calcium into the bloodstream. Uh, and D3, like I said, very similar to our natural form within our body. And that's what you can usually find in supplements. So just make sure it is, um, you know, vitamin D3 on the back when you take a look. And what's the best way to safely regulate iron deficiency anemia. So I would say that's very similar in the sense of how I was talking about vitamin D, not that they're, they're the same thing, but iron is one of those minerals that we don't want too little from an anemia standpoint, but we definitely do not want too much. It is very, very inflammatory to have too much iron in the body. So the way to safely regulate is, again, you do you do have to test. You do have to test your ferritin. Um, you do have to test and make sure your red blood cells are where they need to be so you can kind of find that, that sweet spot. But there are a lot of good food-based irons that uh, aren't made like laboratory-based minerals. They are pressed foods and you can get them in like 15, 20 milligrams. You can't really overdo it on those. So sometimes that's a good way if you're looking just for a long-term iron, but there are also a lot of good highly absorbable forms in there. But testing is testing is definitely key with some of these things here. So, um, and that looks like that's it. If we did miss any, we do have somebody, uh, if there's any other ones that pop up or any ones that I miss, we usually do have somebody follow up with um, and answer those questions or provide uh, the, the opportunity for a free consultation. But um, yeah, again, we really appreciate uh, you guys joining this today. And uh, there's another one in two weeks if you want to check that out. But um, yeah, very, uh, very good chatting with you and we'll see you in the future. Thanks.